Hello everybody and welcome back. I hope you're all ready to talk some more Star Wars because this video was actually a lot of fun for me to make. So uh, Rise of Skywalker came out a few months ago and was panned pretty much across all of YouTube. Not many people had nice things to say about this film and I think that's for good reason. This movie did a lot of things to offend pretty much every type of fan Star Wars had left. It pissed off the TLJ defenders by retconning a whole lot of that movie. It pissed off original trilogy fans by undermining Anakin's sacrifice by bringing Palpatine team back. It even pissed off fans of the animated series by unceremoniously letting them know that Ahsoka was dead. But there's one part of the movie that really stands out to me as being horrendously written, and that would be the part where the heroes go to Pasana. So I really want to take a deep dive into this 20 minute sequence of events and talk about all the places it goes wrong. So without further ado, let us begin. So for context, our hero squad is going to Pasana to find the Wayfinder that will lead them to the Sith planet of Exegol. Apparently, Luke had been looking for Exegol for a while, and he had been writing down all of his findings inside the Jedi texts, I guess? But wait a minute, I thought he hadn't even read them. Sacred Jedi texts? Oh, read them, have you? But okay, moving on from that, we find out that Luke's trail went cold at Pasana, so they're going to pick it up from there. The only problem is, Pasana is a desert. A giant desert. And their whole plan is to just look for it there. Okay, good luck I guess. When our team arrives at the planet, they discover there's actually a festival going on. A celebration that occurs once every 42 years. Oh wow. Okay, I know it references the release of A New Hope. I guess it's just incredibly unlucky for this celebration to be happening right now. So our team decides to head into the crowd. I guess to talk to the locals and see if they've heard anything about a Sith Wayfinder? Right, they're just hoping they can find someone randomly in this festival who can point them in the direction of a Sith Wayfinder. Absolutely genius. However, Poe tells them all that the First Order squads like to patrol these kinds of things, so they need to keep their heads down. Why? Why on earth would there be a First Order patrol here? Do they control this planet? Are they like a police force or something? Are they here specifically looking for resistance members? Are any of these questions going to be answered in this film? No, of course not. So they decide to split up, and immediately afterward, a child gives Rey a necklace. I wonder if that'll be important moments from now. The child also asks Rey what her last name is, which we all know how stupid this ends up being, but that's a whole different batch of stupid that I'm not going to be talking about in this video. She tells the kid that her name is just Rey, then she leaves. Then literal moments later, Kylo Ren starts a Zoom meeting with her. He tells her that he's going to find her and turn her to the dark side. He then steps forward and yanks the necklace that she was given literally, trust me I counted, one minute and 30 35 seconds ago, and he's now able to track her to Pasana. This has to be a joke. Setting aside the absolutely insane implications that come with Kylo teleporting matter through space, and the fact that he can just project himself to her at any time, let's think about this from a writing perspective. When JJ was writing this, I have to assume he knew he was going to want to have the whole speeder chase and Kylo trying to run over Rey, all that good stuff that's going to come after this. His only problem was that Rey and Co were on a distant planet in the middle of nowhere, and Kylo had no leads in regards to where they were. So JJ, obviously distraught over this comes up with a way to do it. He thinks, hey, remember how Rey and Kylo could Skype call in The Last Jedi? Maybe we could use that. And the last couple brain cells responds with, that's good, but in The Last Jedi, Kylo says he can't see her surroundings. Shit, you're right, JJ thought with sweat beating down his face. Hold on a minute. The rain, he shouts with glee as if the weight of a thousand stones had just been force lifted off his shoulders. The scene where the rain from Rey's environment gets on Kylo's face. There's an obvious implication that Kylo can teleport objects at will just by grabbing them. It's perfect. So now all I gotta do is give Rey something he can take that will lead them directly to their exact location, and we're all set. All the while, he was forgetting the fact that we were told by Snoke that he was the one who was connecting their minds, and one of the final scenes shows Rey symbolically closing the door on Kylo. But the worst part about all of this is that it's entirely unnecessary. As stupid as it is, we've already been told that there are First Order patrols here, and not much later they are, in fact, spotted by the First Order. So why do this? Why come up with an insanely contrived method of finding them when you already have a perfectly reasonable one you can use. Even if you really wanted to have this conversation, you can still do that. The Zoom meeting really doesn't bother me that much, as they are the dyad after all. So Rey now runs to the group and tells them they have to go because Kylo is going to find them soon. So as they're running, they get stopped by a First Order soldier who I guess just knows who they are and what they look like, and they do actually stop for him and let him start calling in reinforcements. I guess Rey just forgot that she has the ability to basically just kill him instantly, like she 
you could literally just crush him with the force and keep running. But it's no big deal because before he has time to call in reinforcements, we see him get shot by an arrow right through the eye by none other than Lando Calrissian. How unbelievably lucky that he was just here. I mean, we're told later that Leia let Lando know they were coming, but that doesn't explain why he's here right now. There are literally thousands of people, like I'm talking tens of thousands of people here, and he just happens to be in the exact spot at the exact time they need him to. It's just unreal. Also, no one around them seems to care at all. They don't even take a moment to look at them. They all just keep on dancing while there's a person dead on the ground with an arrow sticking out the back of his head. Nice. Lando tells them that he knows about the Wayfinder because he was with Luke when he was searching for it. So I guess after their trail went cold, he just decided to hang out here for 30 years? Did he just like Pisana that much? What about the Republic? What about Bespin? Did he just forget about them? Are any of these questions going to be answered by the film? No. Of course not. But Lando also tells them they were tracking a Jedi assassin named Ochi, who apparently used a dagger that would lead them to a Wayfinder, which is just hilarious to me. I think this has probably been beaten to death already, but why would you ever send out an assassin whose weapon leads directly back to you? This is a lot like when Jango kills his hired assassin with a dart that leads back to Kamino. And trust me, it was stupid then, and it's stupid now. Now we see the First Order has arrived. Well, that was fast. I mean, hyperspace is fast, but I didn't know it was that fast. Remember A New Hope when Luke had time to start training as they traveled to Alderaan? Yeah, me neither. So Rey and co run off to head into the desert, and Poe spots some speeders and begins to hotwire them. Apparently Finn is surprised that he can do this, but why? Poe's a very experienced pilot who would obviously know a lot about ships, so it actually makes the most sense that he'd be the one to hotwire a speeder. Obviously we know now that this is set up for the backstory later, but that backstory isn't required for him to have this skill. So they race off into the desert on their speeders with the First Order troops following closely behind them on sandmobiles? Oh my god, why? What benefit is there to using treaded speeders when the technology for floating exists? It's not like the First Order has ever been established to be short on resources, so is this actually just for the visuals? As the chase goes on, we see them firing back and forth, and we actually get a little visual that shows us these speeders do in fact have shields on them, which is something I'll talk about later, but I do recall this movie establishing something interesting later on. How? They can't activate their shields until they leave atmosphere. But for now, we do get what's likely the most memed line of the entire movie. Oh, they fly now! They fly now? They fly now! Why would they be this surprised by jetpacks? Especially C-3PO of all people? He was there in Return of the Jedi when Boba Fett gets murdered. He's seen jetpacks before. As this chase scene goes on, we see Poe run his speeder through a tight canyon hoping to lose them. But he doesn't. There's still a First Order troop behind him. So how are they going to get rid of him? Well, Finn decides to take a rope with a hook attached to the end and chuck it at him, which ends up getting caught in the tread of his speeder. They then use this to whip the trooper into the side of the canyon. Okay, setting aside the extremely stupid fact that this would not happen to a speeder that could float. I thought these speeders had shields. Would the hook not just bounce right off of it? Well, the shields are designed for plasma bolts, not physical objects, you might say. Well, forgetting the fact that plasma is still a form of physical matter, is there any precedence for this in Star Wars? Well, have you noticed the shields are still up? Sorry, Master. <laughs> Hmm, well that's pretty vague. So is there anything more explicit? Maybe even something made by Disney? Oof, okay, well that's a little embarrassing, but it highlights to me why analysis of media can be very important. This is an extremely fast-paced movie with quick cuts, quick action, and stunning visuals. I'm sure a lot of people didn't notice anything wrong with that series of events on their first watch through, or if they did, the movie just moves along so quickly that you really don't get much time to think about it. But going back, we can slow things down. I can pause the movie, find references, and prove to you why this writing is contradictory. Moving on though, the chase ends with them finding Ochi's ship, but before they can stop, their speeders are destroyed, flinging them directly onto this tiny patch of quicksand right next to the ship. Although I'm not sure quicksand is the correct term, because to me it seems a lot more like perfect dramatic timing sand. This is because the sand is nice enough to wait for them to finish killing off the storm troopers before it decides to swallow them. So they start sinking in the sand, and they have no way to save themselves. It's too bad there's no one here with the ability to float meters above the ground because that would have really helped them out here. But yeah, the sand eventually swallows all of them, killing them all, and that brings us to the end of the movie.
Oh wait, never mind. Apparently the perfect dramatic timing sand is also plot convenience sand, because it drops them directly into a cave that ends up being the exact place they needed to go. Awesome. I won't go into the logistics of a cave existing below quicksand, because that has been discussed a lot before, but damn is it lucky that they not only didn't die from suffocation, but it also pooped them out exactly where they needed to be. As they search the cave, they find a speeder that apparently has a hood ornament, which is an emblem of Sith loyalists. Seriously, why would you ever write like this? Why would a Sith Sith assassin ride around with an emblem connecting him to the Sith strapped to the hood of his car. Is he the worst assassin in history? I mean, probably. He does also use a knife that lets people find where he was sent from. After that, however, Rey says that Luke sensed that Ochi never left the planet. So if he could sense that Ochi was here, why did he not ever find this cave? Lando told us that they found his ship, and the perfect dramatic timing sand was like 20 feet away from it. Did they just decide to not search the area at all? But almost immediately after this, they find Ochi Ochi's dead body, and they find this super cool dagger that totally doesn't look at all like plastic, but C-3PO says he may be able to translate the writing on it. However, he's unable to because his programming doesn't allow him to translate the Sith language, which is a really dumb inconvenience on its own, but he says the location of the Sith Wayfinder has been inscribed on this dagger. So he is able to read it, and he's able to talk about it, he just can't tell them exactly what it says? So tell them what it's close to? Point to a map? There are so many ways to get around this that it's baffling they didn't think of a single one. But now we get the scene of the sandworm where Rey calms the animal by healing it. I think most of us understood how dumb it was when watching the movie, and it's a huge point of contention for fans when discussing the quality of the film. So I'll just say this. No, I don't think the idea of force healing in general is bad. What's bad is obviously how easily she was able to do it. The fact that it didn't require some search for ancient Jedi knowledge that was long forgotten or anything like that. And it makes Anakin look like an idiot for turning to the dark side to say, Padme when all he had to do was give her some of his force energy apparently. So now we see Chewie pocket the knife and the sandworm opens an escape path for them. It's all nice and convenient, just how JJ likes it. Above ground, however, we see the Knights of Ren, who <laughs> hilariously, all except two, have various forms of medieval weaponry. Not high-tech laser versions, mind you. Nope, it's just an axe, a club, some sort of curved blade on the end of a stick, and a giant butcher's knife. That'll sure be threatening to our blaster-wielding heroes. Oh. <laughs> we then see the heroes making their way to Ochi's ship, in hopes that they can use it to get off the planet. No clue how his ship has been here for this long without being torn apart, but you know, whatever. As they're making their way to the ship, we see Rey begin to leave. That's it. She just starts walking away without letting anyone know why. She seriously comes off as such an idiot in this scene. She's just walking out in the middle of the desert when she knows they're being chased. Does she want the mission to fail? So Poe tells Chewie to let Rey know that they need to leave, so he just kinda saunters off. But unfortunately, the Knights of Ren are just sitting at the bottom of the cliff, waiting for him, I guess. So Chewie gets captured and we see they found the dagger on him. It's unfortunate he wasn't smart enough to leave it on the ship when he left. Now we get one of the silliest scenes in the whole movie. Kylo Ren is flying his ship directly at Rey in what looks like an attempt to run her over, but why? What's his plan here? He said he wanted to turn to the dark side, so why would he be trying to murder her? I'm almost certain this shot was literally just for trailer footage because there's no reason it exists otherwise. If Kylo wanted to push her towards the dark side, then it would make way more sense for him to just land the ship like a normal person and force dueler like he does moments later. But yeah, this ends with Rey backflipping over the ship and slicing off one of its wings. This obviously causes Kylo to crash, but it happens in a way where both wings end up coming off, and the cockpit alone rolls at full speed for like 10 seconds, and then explodes. Like really, like fiery explosion. So he's gotta be dead. I mean the g-force alone from a crash like that would be enough to kill you, but it also erupts in a fiery explosion, so he has to be dead, right? After that though, Finn calls to Rey to tell her that they took Chewie prisoner, and he specifically specifically points at a ship taking off. So Rey uses force pull to bring the ship back down. But while she's doing this, you'll never believe who's coming to stop her. It's Kylo Ren. Wow, not even a single scratch on him. How impressive. Not even some singed clothing or hair. He is absolutely fine. He's just slowly walking away from the inferno raging behind him to remind us exactly what just happened to him. Moving past that, however, Kylo starts using force push to combat Rey's force pull. After some struggle though, something strange happens.
we see Rey accidentally use Force Lightning. This is just incredible. She's so powerful that she can just accidentally fart out an extremely difficult dark side ability. She's trained for one year in the light side of the Force, but apparently she can just use Force Lightning on accident? Wow. What's arguably worse than that, though, is that we're led to believe that she just murdered Chewbacca. This movie actually wanted us to believe that in a struggle to save his life, Rey accidentally sharded out some Force Lightning and murdered Chewbacca. That is some galaxy brain storytelling right there. After Rey murders Chewie, Poe and Finn are yelling to her that they need to leave, but Rey just sits there in awe of what she just did, because not even she can believe just how powerful she is. After that, they somehow make it off the planet. We don't get to see what happened, but there were First Order ships flying in, and Kylo was right there. Why didn't he just do the same thing Rey did to the other ship in order to stop it? Did they have to fight their way out, or was it just smooth sailing? Is the movie going to answer these questions? No, of course not. However, that concludes the hero's trip to Pasana. What an absolutely insane sequence of events. Listen, I know there are dumb scenes in pretty much every Star Wars movie, but I really can't think of one that is more jam-packed with stupid as this one. I really don't think there are any lines of dialogue that come off as well written. Nearly every event that takes place is unbelievably convenient or inconvenient. Nothing feels natural. The proverbial hand of the writer is shown so clearly in every scene. It just blows my mind to think that someone was paid millions of dollars to write this. The Competence shines so brightly when you can see JJ make his story more contrived than it even needed to be, like with the necklace. And you might say, oh, he just did that to set up the fact that she could teleport the lightsaber to him at the end. Well, to that I'd say, not only is that doing an extremely poor job, but it's actually entirely unnecessary. Kylo had a blaster with him when he went to fight the Knights of Ren. It just disappeared in editing. He also didn't have to chuck his lightsaber into the ocean. So what I'm saying is, JJ added unnecessary weak writing in order to facilitate some cool visuals and surprises later, which are also weakly written. But when you start to put visuals and surprises over the coherency of the story you're writing, that's when things will start to fall apart. Well, hopefully I've brought enough to the table to show you why I think this disaster of a sequence is the worst one in Star Wars. If you enjoyed the video, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, you know, all that fun stuff. Social media links are in the description as always. Have a wonderful rest of your day and I hope to see you again next time. Ray, I never told you Ray! What? So what was it? What? What you were going to tell me. When? When you were sinking in the sand, you said, I never told you. I'll tell you later. <laughs>